Thank you everybody for joining today's panel discussion, which is gonna focus on the personalization of the customer experience uh, in financial services. Very, very much a hot topic uh, and something at RFI that we've been uh, engaging with our clients on uh, in recent times. I'm gonna be joined uh, on the panel today by four uh, industry uh, experts who are going to be uh, providing their perspectives on all things uh, personalization. Uh, so I would very much like to uh, introduce uh, everybody ahead of the uh, conversation. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce Nick Tubb, uh, Head of Financial Services at uh, Facebook. So welcome, uh, Nick. Uh, second, uh, Amy uh, Cunningham, uh, Head of Digital at ING. Uh, thirdly, uh, A.B. Chavan, who's Regional uh, uh, Vice President at Backbase. Uh, and last, but very much not least, uh, Jess G uh, Gleason, who is Head of, um, sorry, who's EGM of Digital at uh, Suncorp. So welcome uh, everybody to uh, today's uh, conversation. Um, I'm gonna be um, posing a number of questions uh, at each of you, uh, which focus on the topic of uh, personalization. Uh, we're gonna be approaching it from a number of different uh, directions here, uh, which are gonna include, uh, what's the, the need uh, to focus on financial services uh, or personalization uh, in uh, financial services? Uh, what's the customer demand? Uh, what's the progress that's been made uh, so far when it comes to financial um, personalization in financial services? And also what's the end goal here? You know, when we're thinking about personalization, where do we pay customers uh, on, on the journey? So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll jump straight in uh, to questions. So I think before we you know, really get into the detail here, I thought it's appropriate to start out by just clarifying uh, what it is uh, we mean uh, when we talk about um, personalization in a financial service context. So I might, uh, if it's okay, just sort of pose the first question at Amy. Um, when you hear about personalization, what does it mean to you? Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. It's great to be on this panel. Uh, I think when we think about personalization in the financial services context, it's really about, um, you know, firstly, as a customer, you know, show me that you know me. Um, how do you give me proactive insights based on, on information that you know about me and make my life easier? So I sort of think about it about, you know, banks doing the grunt work in the background, um, looking at all the information that's available, um, using actionable insights from that information, and then really, um, you know, putting the control in my hands as a customer to, rate, to be able to make the choices I want or to be informed with those decisions. So it's about building deeper engagement. It's about building trust um, with our customers. And really, once we get that right, and we can do that on a, on a banking level, then there's a really exciting sliding scale of what personalization can mean uh, into the future. Perfect, perfect. And, and, and Jess, could I get your, your perspectives on that? Absolutely. And yeah, thanks again for having me here today. I 100% I, I agree with what Amy just said. And I think that there's, there's a couple of factors that are playing into why we want to be there for our customers um, with personalization. Obviously, much more competition happening in the market for, for customers and choices around where they choose to interact. And as a financial services industry, we want to stay really relevant to our customers. We want to make sure that they feel like we have their backs, we're on their side, and that the experiences we give to customers are, are what they need, not a generalist, could be anybody kind of experience. The other sort of element of that is obviously we're all interacting with the Facebook, Nick, and the um, and with you know Netflix, and especially for all of us that have been in lockdown for four months, I think we're highly highly uh, familiar with all of our streaming platforms and there is just this new expectation around personalized and curated experiences for customers and if you've got an organization that's a bank that you know you're making payments with every single day they know they should know you they should know you and be able to serve to you things that you need and for me as a customer who banked both with organizations that have really um, you know sophisticated personalization capability and now in a space where at Suncourt, we're really on the beginning of that journey. It's very different. And you, you sort of start to notice it when you're uh, about something that you no longer have. So for me, as, as, a, as a customer, I just think it's an absolute ticket to play and a reason why you would choose to, to bank with a certain financial institution. Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on some of those themes uh, later on in, in the conversation today around where the um, the influences are coming from and the role that 
uh, Netflix and other experiences that customers are having are, are playing in driving the demand for personalization. But before we before we get there, can I, uh, Nick, could I get a kind of a Facebook perspective on what personalization means to you? Yeah, look, I think, um, well, firstly, thanks for, for having me here as well. I think I echo a lot of um, what Amy and Jess have said. Um, and I think if I'm, if I'm kind of thinking about what that means, a lot of it is about the exchange of mutual value. Um, so I think that it's not, there's a lot of talk about personalized experiences that can be very passive and actually the value just exists on one side of the equation. And I think the real personalization is where there is mutual value for both the consumer and the business. Um, things like retargeting or uh, website testing, like they're all things that are effectively conversion efficiencies, really. Like they're really important, but are they true personalization? I think personalization kind of comes when you start thinking about what is the experience that a customer is having with an organization and is that a dialogue is that a conversation um, and I think that's where we're going to get some really interesting kind of um, true value from from personalization perfect thank you Nick and AB before I before I move on anything to add Oh, thanks for having me here. I, uh, uh, it's great to be part of this conversation and I, I totally concur with uh, uh, the viewpoints which the fellow panelists put together. Uh, I think uh, from a Backbase's point of view, even from my own experience from before my Backbase journey, I think personalization is always about providing the right message to the right customer at the right time in the right uh, channel, right? And I think the idea here is uh, uh, for, for our generation perhaps who are pre-millennials, the personalization makes sense because we have seen when it is not personalized and when it is sort of uh, uh, targeted towards a mass and not to an individual, we can see the difference. But if you look at our kids, perhaps the millennials and, and the Gen Zs, for them, it's the, it's the way of life and it is being shaped by the, the, the likes of uh, Facebooks uh, and, and Netflix and the Ubers where they, they, they start their next conversation where they left it off last time. And for them, it's, it's the only way to work with, isn't it? And I think uh, from the point of view of uh, Backbase, what we have seen in last 10 to 15 odd years since the time our product has been there in the market, uh, the kind of conversation we have with our bank banking clients, uh, uh, the conversation we had seven, eight years ago, where to do with how do we remove the friction in the customer journey? Then it moved down to how do we orchestrate different uh, data and the value and the context across different systems and bring it together. And finally, right now, we are also focusing on something called as uh, uh, the, being a leader in engagement banking and which basically means how are you owning that customer experience with the, with the client and that is absolutely a function of personalization that how good uh, is your uh, interaction with the, with, the, with the customer and whether you are maintaining that context from the last time the customer spoke to you. So I think that from my point of view would be a personalization how it means what it means and how it can per perhaps be achieved. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and perhaps, um, AB, before I, before I leave you, let you off the hook, you know, from your perspective, just how critical is it that financial services organisations get personalisation right and, and, and they make it a priority? Yeah, it, is, it is absolutely uh, uh, an imperative for every, uh, uh, every bank, every financial services organisation. Uh, because frankly, um, until about five to seven years ago, that used to be a differentiation. Now these are table stakes. And of course, uh, getting the personalization right, uh, very few uh, uh, entities or uh, companies in the financial services world have actually achieved it. Uh, uh, it is important because now you're no longer competing with your, uh, the, the other entities within your own industry. You're competing with something completely different, like the Facebooks and the, Net mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. Netflix and the Uber. What we call here is this is essentially a war for engagement for customer experience. And unless you have that personalization, unless you own that particular uh, uh, moment of interaction with your customer on your app, on your uh, internet banking, or through any other channel that you can, uh, or any other form factor that you have, uh, you probably uh, will not be able to uh, uh, continue to be a market leader or, or even try and achieve that market leading position. So it is absolutely imperative. And if you take example of something like Australia, I think one of the things uh, that we have seen uh, in, uh, in, in a recent study that we had commissioned with Forrester is uh, almost uh, more than 80% of the, uh, the customers, they really want personalized services. But when we ask them a follow-up question that how many of the uh, banks or the financial services are actually providing it, it is perhaps mm -hmm. somewhere close to 35%. 
and mm-hmm. that is for a developed economy like australia and new zealand in that particular region so that basically calls out that yes there is an opportunity and there is that need that needs to be catered to so it is extremely yeah. important yeah perfect uh, yeah complete agreement here from me on that i think um nick anything to add there in terms of just the importance of making it a priority for your uh, financial services clients yeah look um i think obviously there's the the benefits of personalization and the reason why you would make it a, a priority but i think the other side to making it a strategic priority for a um for for a, for a bank or a financial service organization is um just the a strategic priority within an organization needs to come centrally um, and it doesn't sit within any one given or um, division or one line of business. And I think that's one of the things that personalization needs to really um, think about because both the implementation and the execution of personalization needs to come from the core, if you like. So for me, making it a strategic priority within an organization would do that. It would mean that it comes from the core as opposed to it coming from any one given division. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. And then I think, you know, something that we've already touched on to a degree, but I think is something very evident is, you know, where's where's the demand for personalization coming from? And it's coming from uh, experiences that customers are having in other aspects of their lives. So when they're consuming entertainment, when they're buying uh, retail items, uh, et cetera, you know, that's where the, the demand is coming from, even outside of the financial services experiences that they're having. I mean, again, I guess to, to an extent, a, a rhetorical question, but I mean, you know, it, are we all collectively in agreement that that's where that where the need for personalization is coming from or where the incremental demand is coming from? Perhaps I might pose that of, of Nick again, if that's OK. Um, well, I think like Netflix got mentioned earlier and I recall a. I recall a, a conference where one of the engineers um, mentioned that 80% of all of content consumed on Netflix was basically the result of their personalized engine. Engine, So they are a personalization organization. There's no, no doubt about it. And if you look at the um, some of the fastest growing organizations in the world, they, are, they have personalization at, at the core. So I think what's interesting here, though, is that that personalization that we're experiencing on a day-to-day basis is actually quite invisible and expected. So it's actually thinking about, yes, they're raising the bar. Um, and I think to AB's point, it w- it's a case of they're actually winning consumers' attention by doing this in quite an invisible fashion. And so brands are actually competing for that com- that attention as well. Um, so I think that if a bank starts, I don't know, sends me content about a first home home buyer's guide when they know that I already have a home loan with them, then there's an inherent disconnect between what they're talking to me about and what they know know about me. And I'm probably going to, um, like I say, they're, they're competing with Netflix for me. Um, so yeah, I think there's um, the, these organizations are definitely raising the bar um, and are actually competing on the same level. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And and Jess, I mean, I think you, you mentioned this in one of your answers to your, your first question. Anything you want to add on the, on the topic? No, I agree. There's just an expectation that you get it right. Just get it right. And then that sort of wins you the right to surprise, to give, to, to go into that more integrated financial well-being or conversations about new products with customers just by getting the basics right. I know that um, when I log into to sort of even Instagram, for example, and sorry, Nick, I'll continue to, to tease your platforms, but it's always fun. To poke, to poke fun at the big, the big dogs. But um, you get content because you are Googling something for a friend and it's frustrating because you're like, I don't, I don't need this thing. It wasn't anything to do with me. And so it's, a, it's sort of you talk about the, that one interaction that drives a huge amount of content on your platforms. If you get personalization right and you're looking at the holistic picture, I don't know for a lot of organisations, as you start to look at, you know, particularly financial services cost out initiatives, you start to get personalised messages to drive cost out at a macro level that doesn't, you know, relate to that customer at a micro level and, and they react badly. And it's just, you see it in complaints data, you see it in app store data. And it's a, it's a, it's not, it's not a mystery because the customers tell us when they're not happy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're, we're really, we're really fortunate in that way that we get the feedback, but also creates, a real impetus to everyone to react and react quickly and improve. Yeah, perfect. And Amy, I guess a question here for you really is around, you know, any steps that you've taken or to personalise the customer experience to a greater degree and, and the extent to which that's been driven by by um, 
by customer feedback? Well, I think, yeah, to that point, right, we're getting alerts and updates. I get, you know, a reminder from my Fitbit that I need to drink more water or I get a reminder to pack an umbrella because it looks like it's going to rain, you know, when I'm heading out today. So I think it's definitely about being, um, you know, instant at the right time for you, but also something that's really useful and helpful. So um, we know through, you know, research, you know, in the market and, and we want customers, we customers want us to make banking a breeze for them, which is obviously our job. Um, we know that we want their, they want their experience to be easy. So, you know, whenever, wherever, low touch, that they want it to be um, trusted. So us being really transparent around, um, you know, our interactions and the information that we're providing, you know, making it personal. So keep me informed, reward me, um, you know, help me make good financial decisions. And also around this kind of, you know, quickness or ease and, you know, fast access. So when we're thinking about how we're delivering some of those experiences, it's obviously has to be really relevant. So it could be things like, you know, um, you know, helping you with your savings goals, or we notice you might need some help to consolidate your debt, or um, have you thought about, you know, um, you know, maintaining your product in this way, or, or as simple as, you know, we, we've noticed that you need to update your contact details, and we don't want you to have to, you know, wait weeks for, for a card to arrive and those types of things. So I think there's definitely a spectrum. I think um, as we move towards more sophisticated sort of data platforms and, um, you know, being able to connect into partnerships and ecosystems moving forward, I think the sophistication will definitely grow. Um, but I think at the moment it's really around proving out that, you know, you know, make, making banking a breeze and making sure that when I have my phone in my pocket, um, it's there doing a value, you know, to that point around a value exchange, it's giving me a great value exchange um, with the messages and the personalization I'm getting. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, when I think about personalization at its core, really, is making the best use of information and data that is uh, available on uh, on your customers. You know, do, do we feel that financial services organizations generally are getting getting better uh, and getting better at the speed that they need to be getting better at uh, with regards to making use of the data that they have? I mean, perhaps I'll pose that one at AB if that's no, I think I think that is uh, that is the prevalent uh, discussion, right? That when you have disruptors, when you have new banks, when you have big techs, uh, they are they are providing um, a better sort of a customer experience, which is quite equivalent to the likes of the Netflix and the Uber. And then the question is being asked that whether banks really know how to how to own that customer relationship. Are the banks going to be uh, just the plum the the plumbing lines in terms of feeding the data, whereas the actual customer engagement is owned by these super apps or these big techs? But then there is also other way of looking at it, right? Uh, banks and the systems and uh, the the whole sort of applications and the stacks that they have that enables this kind of a customer experience was not built yesterday. That has been built over a period of last three, four, five decades. And that basically means there is going to be a bit of fragmentation. When it comes to big techs, these are digitally native. The neo banks, they are, uh, uh, or these uh, new startups, the fintechs, they are uh, quite well capitalized, right? For the banks and the financial services, they run on making sure that they hit their numbers year on year. So the profitability becomes important from day one as their KPI. If you don't hit those numbers, you'll probably not have that job. That perhaps is not the kind of pressure that, let's say, uh, the, the, the big tech and the fintechs would have in terms of uh, providing a customer experience while balancing the, the realities of getting the actual revenue. So I think these are the realities of it. But when, when, when we talk to our banking clients, and we have more than 30 plus uh, 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 banks within this Asia-Pacific region, one of, one of the key uh, points uh, uh, well, one of our clients made was Abhijit, at no point does a customer comes to me and tell, tells me that, please give me a digital banking app. That is not their requirement. If, they, if you ask a question to a client that, okay, how much do you want to interact with us as a bank? Then the customer will probably say as little as possible, as invisibly as possible. And I think that is where that point comes in, right? So that in, in order to achieve the kind of personalization, what sort of priorities you need to have, how actually you implement that particular personalization, that becomes important. Does that does this sort of answer your question in that, Kim? Uh, that yes, sense? thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in terms of, you know, to make um, personalization, you know, to drive personalization at the pace that you move that, we need to position it in a way where it's very clear that there's a benefit for the end customer and there's a benefit for the financial in my mind, then, you know, when I look at personalization, I can see a clear win-win 
uh, for all parties in this. And again, perhaps a rhetorical question to a degree, but you know, a, a question for the group. I mean, when I describe personalization as a win-win for all parties, are, are we in agreement with that? And and how can uh, personalization create value for you know all, all parties in the in the transaction? So, uh, Amy, perhaps I'll I'll pose that one with you. If that's if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a win-win in that if you're providing value to a customer and they feel like you're, you know, are building a really deep and trusting relationship with them, then obviously in return there will be a mutual benefit in terms of, you know, you know, being loyal to the bank or, you know, looking at it from a long-term position in terms of a partner for your bank um, from your personal point of view. So I think. Um, there's a win-win. It, it's a spectrum from things as simple as just being able to, you know, manage your accounts and do things really simply and easily to, you know, obviously going through and needing to have that really, um, you know, complex support or help or if you're in hardship, etc. I think really the, the piece that it comes down to is how we make the digital personal. So we know that digital is the way forward or, you know, people on this panel believe in that. But there's also, you know, there's also a huge connection that we need to have with our customers in terms of, you know, not not just being a digital bank, for instance. So how do we really have those um, connection points that we can speak to someone at the end of the phone or that you can reach out and have that chat with someone if you're unsure about a particular instance? I think the connection between having the, um, you know, simple experiences that do their job, but also people feeling like they have that that connection to, to a brand or a bank or a person in a contact centre to call is really important. We can't sort of just step away from the fact that there needs to be the connection of those two, the human and the digital coming together. And I think it's how we bring that together and really bring that to life for our customers um, that that will, you know, will make it a win-win, I guess, moving into the future. Yeah. And and, and Jess, a perspective from you on that as a, another uh, financial services organisation representative? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think it's a really interesting question. Does it need to be mutually beneficial? And there are scenarios where it is, you know, getting alerts around payments in and out of your accounts and being able to, you know, facilitates movement of money and engagement and, you know, ongoing payments, income, et cetera, for the, for the organisation. Mm -hmm. But you get into a tricky area, you know, and I see these debates happen internally um, around what, what, do you, what, what do you do when customers' behaviours are detrimental to the the bank's financial outcome but it's the right thing for the customer so how to make additional repayments on their home loans and what it starts to un unpack is short-term outcomes versus long-term outcomes and that I think has been a real evolution for the industry around how you help customers feel like you're on their side and, and, you know, in some cases that individual transaction is possibly not in the best interest of the balance sheet, for want of a better mm. term, mm. but is in the best interest of, of the long-term balance sheet, the long-term customer engagement and relationship with you as an organisation. And, you know, as a customer, when I was a CBA customer, the happy birthday message, there's no benefit to CBA of, of, of giving that message to customers, but they loved it. They loved it because it was a, you know me, and it costs money to implement things like that. And, you know, as again, an organisation at Suncorp, we're really excited about starting our personalisation journey. The connectivity of data and using the data that you do have is so important, but you do get into the battle of what's the right thing to, to do first, where are you going to get the most customer engagement and where are you going to create the most value? Yeah, so it sounds like then it's, it's juggling perhaps short-term and longer-term objectives for the organisation, is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and then I, I think, um, obviously, when I think about, Nick, when I think about Facebook, I see very much personalisation at the, the core of what Facebook does and what Facebook is, really. I mean, anything you want to to, you know, to, to comment on there? I mean, what, what role does personalisation play in, in the Facebook experience? Look, I think, yeah, personalisation is obviously fundamental to Facebook and it's how people... You, it's fundamental to how people use our products it's fundamental to how advertisers find value on the platform so it kind of it there is that 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 mutual um that mutual value there um for users i'd say that personalization basically drives the whole experience so uh, the product is built on personalization is why people come back and use products and services if you consider that on Facebook alone, every interaction is basically personalized to you. So that means that every single day on Facebook alone, we're bring one point over 1.9 people 
um, person, personalized feeds um, in app every single day. That's kind of where you start to understand the, the scale of that, that type of, um, and, and the priority of that to the organization. So um, I think it's probably, if anybody's opened up somebody else's Facebook app, um, that's the, the, that's the litmus test that you will quickly find that you find that it's probably a very, um, very different experience to what you're used to. Um, I used to do it in meetings where you get people to swap their phones and get people to look at each other's um, Facebook feeds. And, and yeah, you get quite, quite a different, um, quite a different experience. Um, from the advertising side, again, I think that's just how we, um, how we help millions of small businesses find an audience that is relevant to them rather than having to go out to uh, en masse. It's about being able to surface the surface products um, that small businesses have to the audiences that are, that are relevant and, and personalization helps that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, complete agreement there. And it would be a very interesting exercise to uh, open up somebody else's Facebook feed and see what they're seeing versus what you typically see. I tried that. Um, when I, you know, in, in preparation for today's uh, conversation, I was doing my homework and I was uh, doing a bit of reading on, on the literature on uh, personalization. And there were various different articles that were all kind of pointing to the same thing. And that was what personalization seeks to do really is to almost take financial services back to its roots where, where, where a financial services transaction was typically conducted on a far more personalized model, uh, basis. And then historically what, what happened is digitization really pulled uh, typical financial services interactions away from that. And what personalization does to some degree uses digital and uses technology, but to take them back uh, take interactions back to where they where they came from. Perhaps a, a question for for a, for a, a B really about you know are you in agreement with that? Is effectively what we're doing is going back to where we started and and the more personalised one to one type of interactions, but using digital and data and technology to get us there. Yeah, I think it it is right in, uh, to to a certain extent. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, which technology you are using it, it's just an enabler the final outcome that we want and i think that was quite evident when uh, when we looked at that earlier question uh, that what sort of value we are adding for the customer what sort of value being added and is it a, is it a win win for all the stakeholders involved so that in order to achieve that outcome uh, let's break it down simply right i mean right now in today's world if you want to have uh, a personalization the table stakes of it is you need to have a good uh, uh, what do you say uh, a channel like a mobile banking app or your internet banking, or uh, or, or a, a point of sale terminal, which 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 provides you uh, with with probably a, a self help uh, options, right? Uh, self service options, and in all of these things, what is common is that front end is intuitive. It is something that the end user can use. The end user can ask for it rather than being uh, pushed to uh, use that one. So that gives them convenience. That gives them they can they can access those services uh, in their in their uh, uh, own time. That is the first part, convenience. The second part is in, in order to make it contextual to what they need, and they are not sort of repeating their conversation when they change the channel, that if you are moving from mobile app to, let's say your internet banking, or they are talking to your call center, or they are even walking into a branch from, from a bank's point of view, they don't have to repeat any of the conversation or any of the in information that has been provided. So that, that, uh, that experience becomes frictionless. And if that is achieved, that is perhaps the table stake and not many banks or not many financial services institutions have truly achieved this for the simple reason, the way these services are enabled within the context of the operating model of these entities is done through different products and different product silos, which are again provided by a different backend system here, a different application here and the different way of sort of uh, uh, orchestrating the data across. And this mismatch is where that, that, that basic requirement of having a frictional experience goes out of the window. And that is where even, uh, the, that is when the people start comparing that to, oh, but Netflix does that. Oh, but Facebook does that. Why can't you do it? I mean, mm -hmm. there are certain challenges. Of course, it is not something that can be achieved just like this. It will require a bit of journey. It will require a bit of uh, uh, some key imperatives and the strategic directions and changes uh, uh, in terms of how that backend part, how that system uh, integration and the engagement uh, by orchestrating the value across different systems uh, can be achieved. So to mm -hmm. your question, yes, five years ago, we did talk about uh, digitization. We did talk about uh, a seamless onboarding journey for a customer. We did talk about self-service uh, options. 
uh, now we are adding one more layer to it and in order to make it personalized all of these things need to be really uh, synergetic to each other these cannot be these all of these points cannot be done in uh, isolation and to next point earlier uh, if you are thinking about digitalization on the side and not doing it as your core uh, personalization at the core of your operating model you will probably end up having an experience which looks okay but the moment you go to step 3 and step 4 suddenly you see the fissures in there and suddenly you see the mm. friction coming back in there so i think mm. that is that is how i how i look at it yeah yeah agreed uh, i think um you know probably what we've what we've touched on so far i think in this conversation is it is very evident that the personalization takes does take and can take uh, many different forms uh for for customers press a, a, a question for nick really i suppose about in your mind what are the the different types of uh personalization uh that financial services organizations are achieving but perhaps more so can look to achieve uh in the years ahead um so any look maybe i'll i think that the conversation breaks into almost communications and experiences a lot of what we've been talking about there's these there's these two sides so um i might just kind of go through a few things that i think probably straddle both um i'd say motivation is probably on the communication side of things so making sure like thinking of drivers of relevance motivations um and the interests of people making sure that you've got the right message at the right time that's obviously kind of one of the things that we've talked about already i think context is an interesting one um again i think this has been mentioned by by a couple of people um making sure that you are delivering the right experience or the right message based on the context be that time be that i know be that in the, the weather you might have insurance companies that want to deliver certain services or communications based on what's happening um from um from a um an environmental perspective um different voices i think is an interesting one um so different people have different influences on um on people so it might not be that as a brand you should um it's about talking to somebody through the voice of the brand it might be actually how do you use in the world of facebook and instagram how do you use creators how do you use people with different types of influence to um have that conversation that could have a different impact on somebody and make it feel more relevant to them um and then i think the final one that we've all been talking about a lot because i think it's kind of the 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 true um personalization is the different experiences that people expect um so from again from a facebook or instagram perspective that is probably um very much in the messenger or whatsapp um side of side of the camp um and that's about having a true one to one conversation with somebody so that you can actually start to understand the needs and the desires and the motivations of that person and respond to them um accordingly and i think that's where digital can also it doesn't need to be just about kind of um i think there's this this feeling that uh, a messenger bot is very automated and kind of remind you of the the call center systems if you like but actually you can hand over to humans and you can make sure that you're bringing that human touch back in um, back into it so um i think those are probably some of the some of the drivers of relevance um for myself Mm-hmm. and and perhaps a um you know i think again picking up on some of the points we've touched on already but perhaps a, a question for for jess here so, you know working within a, a financial services organization i think when it comes to personalization my sense is perhaps and challenge me if this is this is wrong but you're you're perhaps requiring the organization to think a little bit differently uh, about how it services its customers uh, perhaps at times you're uh pushing the limitations of what's possible from a technology or internal system perspective um is that is that fair i mean what 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 are some of the challenges that you've encountered when you know encouraging the organization on the lines of personalization yeah i mean probably starting from the the bottom of your questions and the bottom of the problem is is data data mm-hmm. becomes one of the biggest enablers but limiters um as as we see things and where we sort of start to see a big correlation is you want a customer experience so we're really trying to drive you know how, like a thinking mindset around what do we want the customer experience to be what do we want the customer outcome to be and then as you follow the rabbit into what can you achieve with the data that you've got then it, it that is where we see the biggest challenges and for like 
I guess, I don't want to use the word legacy, but your legacy banks, legacy organisations that have been around for a long time, there is a lot of disconnected data and a lot of, you know, older systems, delays within the data as they get, you know, into a, you know, a position where we, where we can use, utilise that data effectively. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is actually driving the mindset of our people to say, I'm going to work through that problem, not I'm going to accept a substandard customer experience because of the data and really trying to get the right balance between effort, delivery um, and execution to really get a good experience for our customers. And I think the beauty of that problem, because, you know, you're trying to find the silver lining is to drive some of that experimentation, test and learn mindset. I know probably within Facebook and Amazon and, you know, customers are really data rich. It's all about experiment, test and learn, do what you can, see what you need to do more of versus get it right up front, move on to the next problem. So there's good and bad elements to that, but data tends to be the biggest enabler and limitation when it comes to how you deliver a really good quality personalization for customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. And Amy, do you have an ING perspective on, on that? I mean, anything, any comment around some of the challenges that you've faced or, you know, successfully overcome when it's comes to personalization? Oh, and look, I think, you know, to Jess's point, it's definitely around those foundational capabilities and all the building blocks that you need to be able to stitch together to drive these really great customer experiences. So I think the foundational technology and architectural, you know, strategy and you know, data coming together is absolutely integral in terms of how you can um, operationalize all the insights that we want to. I think the second part is around, you know, personalization is really an extension of your, you know, custom being, you know, being a customer centered organization. So if you are, um, you know, doing human centered design or, you know, at ING we do a pace philosophy around, you know, what does innovation look like for customers? What does um, the right customer experience look like? That robust testing, customer testing and, re you know, research and the discovery, all the pieces of those puzzles, really in terms of the narrative of the organization, personalization is an extension of all the work they're already doing from a customer insights point of view. But how do we operationalize and how do we bring those experiences to life and get them into the hands of the customer? So I think it's um, personalization can seem like a word that um, potentially people, um, you know, can mean so many different things, right, to so many different people. But I think if we think about it as an extension of the work that we already do, the dedication we already have to the customer and how we bring that to life, um, that coupled with that foundational capability, that's getting those two to marry together is the is the end game. Yeah, perfect. And, and AB, a question for you here. I mean, the, 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 the responses to the previous questions touched on uh, technology uh, and the role that that can that can play. I mean, any any comment from you about how technology ha is helping uh, banks improve the customer experience through personalization? I think it's it's sort of a, a self fulfilling cycle, right? I mean, there is a, there is a need from the industry that uh, now five years ago we were talking about digitalization, digitization, and digital banking and whatnot. And there you needed different products and what can I do now rather than over a five year period, I don't want to have a 10 year or an eight year or a five year long core banking transformation or an entire line of business being overhauled. That conversation changed from there. And now we are talking about as, as uh, Amy mentioned, as Jess mentioned that uh, all of these financial institutions are orchestrating their offerings around the human centric design. So it is about journeys. Earlier, it used to be, these are my products. How do I get these products out in the market? And what sort of channels I can provide to the customer to use those mm -hmm. products? Now it's the other way. Now it is, this is the journey I need to uh, uh, put in front of the client, uh, put in front of the end customer. And in order to achieve it, yes, I have 15 different cores. I have another 250 odd ancillary systems and the data is fragmented across uh, all these different stacks. Now I need to stitch it together. Now, stitching that together, that, that is perhaps the one of the major challenges. And I have not come to data at all. I'm just talking about how do you put that journey together for the legacy, the legacy uh, organizations. Now, this is not the challenge that fintechs face. They don't have any legacy stack, which is uh, where the data is fragmented or as fragmented as uh, the traditional financial services uh, organization. There they can start. Uh, because they are, they are already cloud native. They already have a single platform. They already have a ton of data through their primary super app or from their years of interaction outside of financial services realm. And they use that and leverage that and build and provide services, which now cut across into the financial services. So if 
tomorrow i'm using uh, whatsapp seamlessly to do payments then i don't think twice as an end customer but if i look at it from bank's perspective in order to have such a such an intuitive way of tra- transferring money which i use i don't know a million times in a day it's just an extension of my life but in order for a bank to achieve that kind of a channel and that kind of uh, uh, seamlessness i will probably require a few more years so then it also falls down to when it comes to technology what is the basics that you must have you need to have a platform view you cannot have i have a point solution and then i'm done no because your point solution one point solution today will result into 25 different point solutions 18 months later and then you'll again run a 12 month program in order to stitch it together so that's an endless cycle so you need to have a platform view where you can orchestrate uh, all these data all that uh, context that you have across different systems and then leverage that used uh, uh, your big data engine over a period of time now that is another area where not all banks and all financial services are uh, on the on the equal level i mean some someone like uh, a, a cba in australia from uh, i think amy and just they come from that uh, uh, that that uh, bank so they know how how advanced they are or dbs here in singapore so these banks have actually put forth how they have moved ahead of the pack in terms of making sure that they they do have a platform they do have those basic uh, journey stitched together and when you add and sort of nurture and curate that data over a period of time the kind of offerings they have like for example cba during pandemic they have that benefits finder they they uh, uh, sort of were able to provide the benefits worth of 450 plus million dollars worth of pandemic leaves or rebates or concessions and so on and so forth and imagine the kind of value they added to the customer's life so yes technology is enabler technology is important but then rather than starting with something which is absolutely flashy and good looking i would i would much rather uh, uh, would look at fundamental ways of having a single platform unified view empower my customers orchestrate data orchestration in one place and at the same time also empower my employees because they are also quite important when it comes to origination of complex product or talking or getting advice uh, in in uh, in terms of let's say wealth management right so all of these things are important and that's how technology can help it stick together but if the technology which is visible in the foreground it's probably the bad use of technology it has to be intuitive it has to be in the background the customer doesn't even know that yes it is the it is because of the technology that is happening it should be how this institution or how this ecosystem is enabling their uh, financial well being mm, perfect all right i'm going to pose one final question of each of you uh, now and this is really requiring you to get the the crystal ball out and would uh look to the years ahead and really you know what when we think about personalization what's on the horizon uh in in financial services i i might um start with with amy if that's okay and look looking forward what do you see when personalization look i think this is going to be a really exciting space for personalization in the financial services i think it's really going to be about those connections beyond banking so how do we move into a partnerships ecosystem how do we really um you know open banking is here how do we connect with different partners and brands and experiences so our customers have more than just a financial sort of view with us i think innovation is going to be really important but not innovation for innovation sake like useful innovation that we know is going to surprise and delight our customers that we can get into their hands that helps them be in control of their finances and as as um ad said earlier we kind of disappear into the background in terms of being there but not needing to be front and center um and i think really it's about how we will start to move to see you know customers seeing their whole life in the banking app not just you know transacting or, or transferring money between accounts i think it will become a far more holistic experience yeah perfect and 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 jess any any perspectives to add there your your forward looking view on personalization i think the financial um services ecosystem is evolving very rapidly we've seen some big acquisitions of you know fintechs into more mainstream banks we've seen the square after pay deal we're we're seeing sort of big tech come into the financial services industry as well and i think ultimately how banks respond will be a very big determining factor in in the future of financial services and you know i think ab you mentioned it earlier just this this ticket to play of knowing your customer and having your data in line will be fundamental to your ability to respond to that shift in the market but i think we're going to see a much more integrated ecosystem world for our customers how dominant you are a player in that ecosystem will be a determining factor in success 
Mm-hmm. And, and Nick, your 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 final words on the the future of personalization? Wow. Um, look, I think there's there's a big question. I think conversational banking is something I've talked about um, a little bit. I think that is a really interesting space. It's where you can truly provide that mutual value um, between kind of customer and, and business and understand what somebody wants. Um, I think it. W- I think there's. We also need to be conscious of the balance between relevance and privacy as we're going forwards. Uh, I think that's a really big one. So obviously important to recognize we're in a period of change there um, when it comes to personalization in the digital ecosystem. And I think we're seeing that play out amongst regulatory, technological, um, societal. There's lots of different things at play here. So how we balance that desire for relevance versus the responsibility of privacy um, is something I think is going to be um, very important as we move forward. And then finally, I think just the proliferation of banking experiences that we'll probably start to see. So I think to um, to Amy's point, open banking is probably going to broaden the number of um, experiences. If you think about what Netflix has done to content diversification, we'll see the same in terms of products within banking. So the question might actually be, more about kind of like how is personalization going to help consumers find the right product if the um, if the products and services just start really proliferating and diversifying. Mm-hmm. And last but not, not least, AB, any any final words on uh, the future of personalization as far as you see? I think I think with with open banking, data privacy, I think those are the two key things which the fellow panelists already talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that open banking will also uh, and the privacy related considerations will also put additional pressure on big techs, on neobanks, which perhaps, uh, or the fintechs, which perhaps have, uh, haven't had that kind of a regulatory scrutiny that legacy uh, financial services organization um, have come to live with over the last several decades. Mm-hmm. So I think when it comes to the products and the types of the products, product origination, the jurisprudence, as well as the, uh, the, the way of running uh, that, that product origination factory, so to speak, I think the legacy uh, financial services organization will always be a little ahead. When it comes to customer experience, of course, the, 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 the big tech and the fintechs will always have a head start for the simple reason they, don't, they are not uh, shackled down by their uh, fragmented uh, uh, system or the stack, the technology stack that they have at play. I think as within the data piece, I think that is where uh, currently you see a lot of movements. Uh, 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 there, is, there is a good front end being owned by uh, fintech. Uh, there is good product origination being owned by legacy. And that middle fat data layer in terms of who makes the move in there and who can actually stitch it together. Good examples like CBA, like DBS. And I think in the next two to three years, uh, you will essentially find uh, those breakout players who have been able to stitch it together and mm-hmm. through collaboration, not just competing. It, it may not be one uh, silver bullet that, yes, I need to do all of these things together through open banking, through that partner ecosystem, through fintech uh, collaboration. I believe in another two to three years, you will probably have uh, those, those key gold standards uh, appearing in there. But jury is still out. It's not a fully, mm-hmm. uh, the war for engagement is not over and no one is a clear winner at the moment. This is the starting mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. Okay, we're, we're at time. So I'll, um, I'll stop firing uh, questions at each of you now. So thank you very much for your uh, input into what has been, I think, a great conversation around the, uh, the current and future uh, state of personalization uh, in uh, financial services. Um, I might just offer my um, thanks to uh, each of you. So to Nick, uh, to Amy, to AB, and to Jeff, thank you very much for your uh, input uh, into the uh, conversation uh, today. Uh, I think final words from me, uh, which is great today and thank you very much for the session thanks alex thank you. thanks alex Great to be here thank you